and welcome to this Astranti pre-seen video series analysis for the February 2018 strategic case study exam on gym operator Royal Gyms. So before we begin, I'm just going to start by telling you a little bit about myself and a bit about how we are going to approach the pre-seen and the things we're going to be looking for. So my name is Peter Steffer. I am the director of SEMA here at Astranti. I've been with the company since 2013. And during that time, I've written and marked many of the mock exams that we provide. I've also written mocks for other tuition providers. I've also written many of the study texts that you may have used. And if you see in the bottom left hand corner there, my Facebook page, on the run up to the exam, I'll be posting all kinds of hints and tips. So now let's take a look at the video series themselves. So for starters, I'm gonna go through the pre-scene section by section, clicking up on all the key points, the things that you should be looking for, the things you should be pulling out of the text and analyzing. I'll then be applying them to the case itself, what they mean for the company and what it means for the industry that it operates in. Applying certain business models to it, ones that you may have learned in your objective test studies and the likely exam issues. So looking at it and thinking based on this information, a likely question is X. And also other just hints and tips, general things that will help you gain extra marks in the exam. I'll then go on to my strategic analysis video, which will be taking the pre scene as a whole and summarizing it and applying it into lots of different key business models and key business theories before rounding up with my top 10 issues. So these are the most likely things I think are going to come up in the actual exam. So how's it gonna work? As I said, it's gonna go through, I'm gonna go through it section by section. I'm gonna assume that you haven't read the pre -season. I'm gonna assume that this is all new to you and we are going through it together for the first time. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna ask you to make uh, notes yourself. So I'll stop the videos at the start of each one and ask you to make notes on a certain number of pages and then we'll go back and review it together. And as I've said, at the end, we'll go through a full strategic analysis and top 10 issues. So first of all, some key things that you should be aware of. Now the pre scene is the context of the exam. It's the, the context of the, the company that is being examined. The, the background information, as it were. So once you've read the pre-scene, this should all be forming a foundation in your mind. And when you go into the actual exam, all the, the unseen questions that come up in the actual exam, you should be answering them based on this base context from the pre-scene. But it's worth noting that you shouldn't write anything based on the pre-scene. And that's because you're not necessarily gonna be tested on something that's in the pre-scene. You'll be tested on the unseen material that you are given in the exam. If that unseen material is nothing to do with the material in the pre-scene, then you shouldn't be using the pre-scene material to answer the question. You, you, you must always use the unseen material. Having said that, you should always be thinking about the pre-scene material. Now you're given this in advance for a reason. You're supposed to learn it and you're supposed to gain as much understanding as you can about the company so that you can use this information in the actual exam. So let's begin our analysis then. And the first thing that you'll see at the top of the page here is a bit about the role that we are playing in the strategic case study exam. We are a senior manager working in the finance team of Royals, reporting directly to the chief financial officer, and our role involves giving advice on special projects and strategic matters. Now, this is very much in keeping with the role that SEMA themselves have said you are playing in the strategic case study exam. You can find that document online on the SEMA website. But what is important about that is we need to keep that in mind, keep it as a context as we are going through our analysis. Take this point here about reporting directly to the chief financial officer. 
So what kinds of information will the chief financial officer need? They won't want just all the raw data to then have to do the work themselves. We need to be giving them effective, concluded advice with a recommendation. We also need to ensure that we are using all our knowledge of the SEMA syllabus. Now, primarily, the case study is more e-focused, particularly compared with previous case study exams, such as the operational management level one, but we still need to bring in information from F3 and from P3 as well, particularly with regards to funding and also risk management. And these are two things that we need to keep in mind whenever we are giving our advice. Don't just say a project should be done because it looks good, because it's in keeping with our strategy. We need to think about how this project is going to be funded. We need to think about how our resources can be effectively utilized. We need to be thinking about the various risks involved with the project. And we'll need to keep those in mind as we are giving advice on these special projects and strategic matters. Now, with regards to special projects, project management may also come into it. Now, some of you may be thinking that that is an E2 subject and you'd be right, but SEMA have considered everything that you have learned up to this point to be assumed knowledge. So you may not be directly tested on project management, but you need to be aware of it because it will be indirectly useful to answering your questions. And by that, I mean be aware of the implications of project management, the process of project management, when you are perhaps suggesting that a project go ahead. You need to think about how a project team needs to be implemented, how they need to monitor the progress, and what they need to do when the project has finished, a post-completion audit. They need to learn what went well, or analyze what went well, analyze what went poorly, and how they can learn from that going forward with future projects. We also have to keep the overall strategy of the organization in mind as well with these projects. Is this goal going to help us achieve our ultimate goal as an organization? Does it tie in with the strategy? Does it tie in with the method of operations that we implement here at Royals Gyms? If it isn't, then perhaps it's not something that we should be going ahead with. So as you can see, we're already starting to paint a picture of the kind of role that we are playing here at Royals and also the kinds of things we need to keep in mind as we continue our analysis through the pre -scene. The sorts of things that we will be expected to analyse the pre -scene in the context of and also as we sit the unseen exam, the sorts of things that we need to be bringing up in our answers. So with that in mind, let's continue now and look at a bit about the company itself, the company background. Now, a lot of people, when they get the pre-scene, they instantly move on to the financial statements. They move on to the risk report. Uh, they move on to the operational section. All the kinds of tangible things that they can analyze themselves more easily. And often they'll skip a lot of the background, a lot of the introduction, because they don't think it is worthwhile devoting any time to. But actually, just as the pre-scene is the context of the unseen exam, the introduction, the background is the context of the pre-scene. And so there's actually a lot of information in these opening couple of pages that we can pick apart and analyze and also use as a context as we continue throughout the pre -scene. So the first thing you can see here is that Royals is an unquoted company. So that means they are a company, they are a limited liability company, but they are not publicly traded. You cannot buy shares for Royals on the stock market. And there's quite a few things we can read into just by knowing that. So of course we know we do not have lots of different shareholders to appease, but it also means that we may find it harder to raise additional funds. One of the great things about a listed company, a quoted entity, is that they can go to the stock market to raise additional funds, quite substantial amounts of funds to invest in the business. 
And in the context of the pre-scene, what this may mean is that perhaps there is an opportunity for a future listing. That might be something that we are asked in the exam to perhaps analyze the possibility of listing on the stock market of an initial product offering and what benefits and drawbacks there may be to doing that. And it's worth noting that that has been a likely issue in previous strategic case studies when it's been a private entity. It's the kind of thing that we're looking back here in our role, special projects, strategic matters, the possibility of listing on the stock market falls into those categories. It was founded in 2009 by brothers Marco and Frederick King in the country of Highlandia. Now, Highlandia is a well-developed economy and its currency is the Highlandia dollar or H dollar for short. And whenever you see a currency listing in the pre-scene, you should be thinking about economic factors, political factors that could impact the business. So the strength of the Highlandia dollar were to fall, then that could cause a lot of problems, particularly if the company gets some of its equipment from overseas, or if indeed it had gyms overseas as well, that could cause a problem. And within Highlandia, we also need to think about inflation rates, interest rates. How do we mitigate ourselves, uh, mitigate the impact of those with regards to the damage on us? Obviously, interest rates are something that need to be considered whenever we are talking about taking out loans from banks, because if the interest rate goes up, then of course we're paying back a lot more. And if the interest rates are particularly high, then perhaps the loan should be something that we either postpone or rule out altogether, or at least wait until the interest rate comes down. The fact that Highlandia is a well-developed economy is also relevant because that allows for luxury products such as gym memberships to flourish. If you live in a war-torn country, then you're unlikely to be too concerned about the fact that there aren't enough good gyms with good weight rooms in your local area. The next paragraph talks a bit about the brothers themselves, so Marco and Frederick. Brothers both have a strong history in business ventures, with Frederick running a successful international property development business, and Marco a profitable retail sportswear operation. And have both had a lifelong and active interest in sport and fitness. So we've got two people here with quite different skills, both very relevant to the industry that they now operate in. So we've got someone like Frederick, who's very much experienced in the property market, which of course is relevant for a gym because a gym needs buildings, needs buildings in, in perfect locations to get the right clientele. And we've also got Marco who has worked in sportswear. So we'll perhaps be quite keen and quite experienced and knowledgeable about the needs of people who have an active interest in fitness. And from a business theory perspective now, we can start to build a picture about the importance of these two brothers. Not only are they the founders, they also have a lot of knowledge and a lot of expertise in the specific area. And so it's likely that they will have been the driving force behind a lot of innovations, a lot of growth within the organization. And so when we look at, say, our stakeholder matrix, we perhaps consider them to be key players of the organization and that their involvement within the business is critical to its continued and its sustained success. And the whole idea for the business came about when Marco was traveling around the world on business and noticing that there were quite a few countries where there were gyms that offered a 24 hour experience with no contractual membership. In other words, you didn't have to sign up for six months at a time or 12 months at a time. You could just buy a weekly pass, a daily pass, etc. And notice that there was nothing like this in Highlandia, but it was available across the world. And so he came up with the, the idea that he could bring this model over to Highlandia. And what 
what we can read from this is a the business sense of Marco, but also the threat of future, if not present. We may find out more as we read through the pre scene. Competition from these gym companies overseas. And the reason why they present a threat is because if you look at various models, such as Porter's Diamond, it suggests that if a home country, a home market, in this case not being Highlandia but being the other countries that have these gyms already, they get very accustomed to that way of working, they gain a lot of experience, they deal with a lot of competition, and as such they perfect their 24-hour no-contract gym. And this means when they try to export it into other countries, perhaps Highlandia, for example, they're already ahead of the competition in that market because they have perfected that model in a market where that model is already existing, where there's already a lot of competition around it. But at least at the time, there was nothing like this in Highlandia and thus, it was seen as a real opportunity, particularly for those who are constantly moving around and cannot afford to be tied into a long-term contract. We found that this made fitness very accessible and flexible to his needs. So again, we were talking about achieving customer needs, helping customers meet their needs which in a sense is the essence of every business and particularly this one. It's all about making fitness accessible and flexible to consumers' needs. And so this is quite an important phrase that we need to keep in mind as we continue our analysis. If you remember at the top, it spoke about strategic matters and I was mentioning how things that don't abide by our strategy, things that don't help us achieve our strategies are perhaps not things that we should be doing. And now we have an overall objective, one of the overall objectives of the business, the reasons why it exists to make fitness accessible and flexible to customer needs, because this is what it granted Marco when he was going overseas and other gyms were offering this same experience. And this is the experience that he is bringing to the Highlandia market. As there was nothing like this available at the time. But there were the right conditions for it as interest in health and fitness was steadily growing. But the market was dominated by high priced gyms with restricted hours and long-term memberships contracts. So a few things to read into here. We can see that it is a growing market, or at least was a growing market, which of course is a continued opportunity of the business, or opportunity for the business, I should say. But we need to be concerned with the strength of competitors. The market is dominated by high-priced gyms with restricted opening hours and long-term membership contracts. So these gyms are likely to have a lot more power than Royals do. And also, if that is how the gym market has always worked in the country of Highlandia, then we also have to think about the social aspect of it as well, what the consumer thinks. They think that that is the right way or the only way in which to maintain a gym membership. And thus we have to break through that social barrier and to provide a different experience for the consumer. But nevertheless, the two brothers started the business in 2009 in the capital city of Highlandia. This is an appropriate place to start. Obviously, if you think about capital city, so if we think about cities like London, and Paris and Madrid, not only are they usually more populous than other areas of each country, thus there is a greater market for the gym in a smaller area, but generally also more affluent perhaps, and also live different lifestyles. Obviously we often hear in the media about the more 24 hour lifestyles of larger cities, 
For example, New York, they call it the city that never sleeps, and thus people might want to go to the gym at all hours of the day. But going back to Marco's story of international travel, it's also relevant because the larger capital cities often have more international business people visiting them. And thus, this is the ideal market for this kind of business because there will be the traveling business personnel clientele for the company, for the gym. And as predicted, the two brothers' different skills have come into use. With Frederick able to locate two excellent properties and Marco using a contract from his days in sportswear retail to purchase good equipment for the gyms. So again, we're reiterating the importance of these two brothers to the business. If it wasn't for them and their respective skills, the business would never have started. And they each split the share capital 50-50. So this very point, we might find out information later, but at this very point, they both own half of the company. Now the next paragraph talks about the aim of Royals. Now, earlier I mentioned that making fitness accessible and flexible to all customer needs was something that we could infer from the story about how the company came into being. And that, in a sense, has been vindicated in this next paragraph here, where it talks about how the aim of the company, why it was launched, was to make gym-based fitness highly accessible by removing obstacles to exercise, perhaps the obstacles that other gym memberships had created, such as long-term contracts, expensive, restricted opening hours. And the way in which they've gone about doing this is by ensuring that they are affordable, they're open at all times, so regardless of what your daily commitments are to your profession, to your families, etc., you can still find time to go to the gym. And are in locations where they're easily accessible by public transport. And providing flexibility in the offering of non-contractual memberships. So now when we're thinking about future strategies for the organization, we need to be keeping these things in mind. If there's a, a great opportunity to open a very exclusive club out in the country, then does that tie in with our aims, with the reasons for our business? Is that place easily accessible? No. Is it going to be open all times? Perhaps not. Is it going to be affordable to most people? Probably not. Therefore, it's perhaps not in keeping with the strategy of Royals and thus when we were to analyze it using our suitability, acceptability, feasibility model, it would fall down under suitability. It's not a suitable project for Royals. It's not in keeping with the way in which Royals operates. If we start going against this, then we'll end up losing the loyal customer base in which we have built up. Now, Royals operates what is known as a budget gym with high quality but affordable no frills approach to exercise and fitness training so what this means is it's likely that the gyms only contain exercise and fitness equipment they're less likely to have some of the more high cost prestige facilities that some of the higher end clubs will have such as saunas, steam rooms, swimming pools, etc., because of the high running costs of these things. It's just about providing a quality but affordable approach to exercise and fitness, which means that costs will be very important to the organization. If it's not going to be high priced, then we have to make, the, uh, make our money by reducing our costs, keeping our costs low, and going for higher numbers. And those of you who are familiar with Porter's generic strategies will identify that perhaps we're going after a cost leadership strategy here. And so it's important that we don't do anything that causes our costs to increase by a significant amount 
if it's not going to yield higher numbers because we need to keep the cost down because that is how we are marketing our gym. That's how we are marketing our products. We are cheaper than the competition. We don't want to do anything that increases the price that we have to charge the consumer because one of the problems with the cost leadership style of strategy is that often a lot of consumers use you because you are cheaper and therefore if that is what they care about when a cheaper company comes out they'll switch to that cheaper company there's often not as much loyalty when you are a cost leadership company and for those of you looking for some sort of real world external reference point the business model the history and the size of this company is very much like a UK company called the Gym Group. They operate in very much the same way as Royals offering non-long-term memberships for day passes, week passes, monthly passes for 24-hour cheap affordable gyms. And as we can see, there certainly is a market for this given that the company is currently very popular. And total membership and new gym openings have grown rapidly since 2009. Preeti has given us a chart here. We can see that we've grown from only two gyms in 2009 to 125 gyms in 2017. And what I've done here is add the levels of growth for both the number of gyms and also the average members per gym. And we can see that grew very, very rapidly in the first few years, and then a huge increase in 2012 to 2013, which of course, if we look down here, can be explained by obtaining investment from a Highlandia-based funder, GEM Venture Capital, who would have Obviously added quite a lot in funds. As we can see here, invested eight million H dollars, which two million was loan, and six million was for shares in the business. And that can be seen here in the rapid expansion between 2012 and 2013. But what's also encouraging is that we can see that whilst the growth is slowing down, which we would expect, it's still very high and very consistent from then onwards. You can see from 2014 to 15, 48% growth, 46% between 2015 and 16, and 45% within 2016 and 2017. So it's quite likely that we will see similar levels of growth in the 40s in the next year. Although we can also see that the actual average members per gym has decreased over the years. Generally, it's decreased year on year with a few small increases here and there, such as between 2010 and 2011. And just as there was a huge increase in the number of gyms between 2012 and 2013, there was a huge decrease in the number of members per gym. Now, we would expect this because we would expect certain openings of gyms to cannibalize the members of other gyms. If you are in a certain area where there is only one Royals gym in the, the north part of the town, in the north part of the area that you're from, and everyone is traveling to that northern gym and then a gym opens in the southern area then obviously there will be people in that southern part of the area that will now go to the southern gym but what cannot be denied is the huge increase in the company since it began if we had two gyms in 2009 with 4,502 members per gym. That means in 2009, we had 9,004 gym members. And in 2017, with 3,514 members per gym on average, with 125 gyms, it means that now in 2017, Royals have 439,250 gym members. An increase in members of 4,778.4%. But there's no denying that the big watershed moment here was the 
investment by GEM Venture Capital. So let's look a little bit more at this now. So the company that invested in Royals bought approximately 40% of the shares. Now they didn't take away shares as such from the brothers. Instead, 67,000 new shares were issued giving the company a grand total of 167,000 shares now in issue. But one of the most important parts of this deal was a 45 H dollar or million H dollar credit facility with the bank. So not only did the company give the company 8 million H dollars, but they now have the ability to call on up to 45 million H dollars in debt financing which of course is far cheaper and more quick to raise than equity financing, which of course is selling the selling of shares. Although well, the disadvantage of debt financing is of course it has to be paid back come rain or shine, whereas equity financing doesn't actually ever have to be returned. It does also mean now that the company is ultimately going to have to cater to the needs of GEM, because of course they now own 40% of the business and of course have provided them with a lot of money, a lot of revenue. And of course they also owe them 2 million H dollars as well because 2 million of that 8 million investment was a loan. So again, when we're thinking about our Mendlow's matrix, we've got the two brothers as key players, but GEM are also key players. But the company did improve the governance of Royals by adding two non-executive directors to the board. And non-executive directors, of course, are important because they act in the best interest, so they make sure that the executive directors are acting in the best interest of the company as a whole and not just the directors themselves. So before we finish this video, let's take a look at a summary of the kinds of things that we have identified in only the first two pages of the pre you can see there's already a wealth of information. And the first thing we'll do is we'll start building our SWOT diagram that we'll continue building as we work through the video series, of course, SWOT financing, uh, so SWOT model, otherwise known as a corporate appraisal, very important to the strategic level case study because this is the overall picture of where the business is currently at and where it's heading. So I've thrown in a few potential things that we've discussed so far. So of course, the strength of the founders, the importance of the founders, the current sustainability of the company is growing at a, an established pace and that they have cash available. Weaknesses, of course, include the fact that they're relatively new and not only are the company relatively new, they're very much the style of company, the, the industry in which they're operating in is relatively new as well, or at least they're way of operating within that industry. And that ties in with the strength of the larger competitors still operating the more traditional way of operating gyms. There are opportunities for the business going forward though, like going public, although it's less likely they would want to go public while they still have this cash available from this credit facility. I think it's a growing market as well. There's very much a social advancement in terms of the awareness of good health, the awareness of maintaining good fitness levels, and thus is likely to drive more and more members of the public into gyms. Threats though include state funding. I mentioned in the pre-scene that whilst the market was dominated by premium high-priced gyms, and there was a very much a lack of state funding to state-run organizations, if the government were to start putting more money into this because of the fact that the government and the country as a whole was getting more and more aware of the benefits of health and fitness, then an increase in state-run memberships, state-run gyms, state-run sports centers, etc. could mean that those places are even more cheap to visit and thus it could take away consumers members from royals because we also have to think about loyalty if we are going after this very cheap market cost leadership market then are we risking or running the risk of 
members only using our gyms because we are the cheapest and thus when someone cheaper comes along we'll lose them and also threats from overseas rivals earlier I was speaking about other countries where this kind of gym is more the standard and thus the companies within those countries will have become far more acclimatized to the way in which they do business they will have dealt with plenty of competition within this style of operating gyms as well and thus will have improved as a result we can also start composing our mendelo's matrix here you can see in the top left hand corner that's the low power low interest stakeholders we've got the general public and suppliers to our organization in the low interest high power excuse me the high interest low power we've got staff individual staff who work within our gyms and also the individual members of our organization in the low interest high power we've got the classic examples of the bank and the government banks aren't too interested in our operations as long as they get their payments and governments aren't too interested in what we're doing unless we are breaking any laws and then in that key players category at the bottom that's high interest and high power we have our founders and also the GM the GEM venture capital group who of course will be very interested in what's going on in the organization how much return they're getting for their investment particularly now that they have got two non-executive directors on the board of Royals so in conclusion we can already see that from a fairly small piece of the precinct only one and a half pages of introduction we can already gain this wealth of information from the precinct of things that we will need to use in the exam and things that we will build on and knowledge that we will use as we continue to analyze this precinct will we find out new bits of information that allow us to capitalize on these strengths we have that will overcome these weaknesses, take advantage of those opportunities and mitigate the potential impact of those threats and so on. And that brings us to the close of this first video. Please join me for the next video, which will take a close look at the Highlandia Health and Fitness Club industry. So I hope you've enjoyed this sample video and more importantly found it useful. Before I go, I'd like to quickly tell you about a few of the products that we do here at Astranti Financial Training, specifically for our case study courses. We have a study text which details all the key theories in which you will be expected to use in your case study exam, as well as details of how to approach the pre-scene and the case study. We also have a series of course videos detailing how to answer case study questions. This is actually an area in which many students struggle. Most of the scripts that I've seen, the failing scripts that I've seen, has actually been due to poor case study technique rather than lack of knowledge. We also have a series of pre-scene analysis videos based on the current up-to-date pre-scene detailing all the key bits of information and likely issues you may face in the exam. Next up is the industry analysis, a pack detailing information about the industry that the precinct company resides in, information about the key players within that industry and more background information on the industry in general. We also have a range of mock exams created for each level and based on the current precinct which is a great way to get some practice in before you sit the real thing. We also offer marking and feedback on those mock exams so you can see where you are going wrong and where you can improve. Finally, we have the master classes. These are two one day classes taken by our expert tutors to give you all the, the hints and tips you need to really add to your chances of passing the exam. Also, if you take our full course, we offer a pass guarantee, which provided you have met all the requirements of the pass guarantee, you will get a free reset on the next exam should you fail to pass. So once again, thank you for your time. If you're interested in any of these products, please visit the website www.astranti.com for more information. Thank you.